Hey, back on is Miriam Bellamy. Got a little bit of feedback there. Hopefully that'll go away. Um, so we are here with Christy Moore. Our topic is understanding trauma and neurofeedback. Wellness coach. She uh, was so inspired by what she experienced herself with neurofeedback and in her family that she went back and got a master's and I'm going to get another master's. Christy, will you say a little bit about as a mom and now as a professional, what was your experience with neurofeedback and what inspired you to uh, to really learn about the brain the way you have? Well, I, I have to talk it up to whatever NeuroOptimal did to my brain because before I never had any any notion of going back to school and starting a whole career in something that I knew nothing about. So um, I have to, to thank NeuroOptimal for that because whatever it did, it sparked some creativity, some, some notions in there that I didn't maybe have before. So um, we just, we were impacted so um, in depth in our family with my son, my daughter, my husband, that I just decided I wanted to learn more and I wanted to help other people. And this is a tool that can help so many. Um, and I just I just became very passionate about brain health and education and, and supporting other people where they were. Um, and that just kind of naturally led to a road of wanting to learn more and more and more and more and more. So this just opens up a new possibility for me to help others. Um, yeah, using... So your first master's is in brain health and education? It's a, no, my first is a bachelor's in cognitive studies and psychology. And then now I, and then I have three different health coaching certifications in from brain fitness, health and wellness, functional nutrition. And then I'm pursuing a master's in mental health counseling, specializing in neuro counseling. Okay. So they're all brain aligned strategies to help the brain um, with, with, it's called neuro counseling and it's a new field. Okay. Um, in the in the realm of mental health counseling, so yeah, as a major family therapist for 22 years, the more I learn about the brain and neurofeedback, the more I think counseling without it is really missing such an important piece. So it's really cool that there's something called neuro counseling that's coming about. The more uh, scientists understand about the brain, so very exciting and very happy to have you with me today. Um, so talking about this really important topic of trauma um, and understanding how it impacts um, the development of the brain and how neurofeedback uh, can be helpful there. So my first question for you today, Christy, is how, how does trauma impact brain development? Yeah, um, I think one thing that we want to learn, um, first of all, and remember is that trauma impacts us very differently than the stress response that we're all familiar with. Um, that we hear about a lot um, because trauma impacts our ability to feel safe. Okay. And, and that's a, a very significant difference between trauma and just stress, mm -hmm. right? Because stress doesn't always impact our ability to feel safe, but trauma does. Um, and, and research shows that through each other, and our ability to um, work with one another, right? That is how we have to feel safe in order to grow, to heal, to restore, to repair. So, I'm sorry. That's pretty powerful. Our ability to connect is, is very much related to our ability to feel safe. I mean, that's like you said, that's how we feel safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And trauma impacts our ability to connect. Yeah. Yeah. So when we have trauma and we have these um, repeated triggers, whatever they are, we are continually firing at this highly sensitized super highway in the brain. And the more we're firing those triggers and alerting that brain that we're not safe, then that brain creates this great stress arousal and the more it's going to remember it. And so this trauma gets hardwired. Okay. Just it's just really deep in there. It's 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 in the vein of us, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so um 
And I think we have to understand, too, that our brain is a dynamic organ that is shaped by three main things. Genetics, okay, um, our physiological internal environment. So our nutrients, our toxins, our hormones, our drugs, and oxygen. Mm -hmm. And then experience. Okay. okay. So those three things really shape this dynamic organ. And when I say dynamic, meaning if I broke my arm tomorrow, life goes on. I still got to function. I've still got to write, learn how to drive, move, right? So the brain, it's got to go on. Yeah, don't we know that as moms, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that brain's going to keep going on. So even though it's exposed to this trauma, the brain is a dynamic organ. It's going to keep going on somehow. Mm -hmm. And so when it's been highly sensitized to these patterns and these neural firings, then, and it's, and it's in this locked down, immobilized state, then we start seeing compromised development in numerous areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think Christy too, when you're talking, cause I, I'm always thinking about all, all the whole family, right? So if we have a child with adoption or, uh, you know, epigenetics, whatever, if trauma is a factor, I think we can develop uh, a kind of sensitized response to their sensitivities. We Absolutely. get really backed up and you know we see something happen and you know we react mm -hmm. um and that can keep this thing going it's almost like almost like the whole family itself is a kind of a brain if that makes sense right mm -hmm. sort of bouncing off of each other and remembering these pathways remembering these reactive patterns i mean that's that's where my brain goes <laughs> um, right. talk about how stuck not just inside the brain, but in the family, it, it ends up being. It absolutely does, because then we develop these patterns of stuckness because we don't know how to respond, right? And so yeah, we're kind true. of stuck. We're reacting. And so or we're uh, yeah. And so some of the things, one of the major things that I think I've learned the most about um, with trauma is that it really impacts this, our social engagement system. So our learning and our emotional regulation, right? And so it impairs our ability to integrate information and to um, respond to those attachments, to those relationships um, appropriately. That in turn is going to affect all of our attention, all of our learning, trouble learning from experience, um, sensory integration, right? So... So we're impacting a whole dynamic system and that the way through to heal that is through each other, is through that social engagement system. So we've got to unlock that, right, mm -hmm. um, in order to be able to heal not only the individual, but through through our relationships, through, you know, the rest of our lives, mm -hmm. right, because it impact, can impact us forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're so powerful going through each other, through those relational, those dynamics, those interactions that happen every day, right? Mm -hmm. so, so thinking about this, then how does how does neurofeedback or neurooptimal help? How would you think about that? So if you think about what um, neurofeedback is doing, right, it's mirroring back the cortical activity from the scalp to the individual through the form of interruptions in music. It's, it's it's acting essentially like a mirror saying, here's, here's who you are today, right? Mm -hmm. And then that brain is learning from that, from those interruptions. We are, so, so think of it this way. If the goal is opt in for neurofeedback is optimal performance, we're going to call that neural integration. How that central nervous system is going to become balanced and coordinated right, to process this electrical flow of information so that it is flexible and resilient. Okay. Because when it's not flexible and resilient, we're going to be impaired. We're rigid. We're not integrated well. So the neurofeedback in general, we're wanting to help that brain self-regulate self-organize and it has the ability to do that it's been doing it since the moment it was conceived 
Yeah. It's been yeah. self-regulating. It's been self-organizing. And it has the ability to do that. It just does this through hearing, hearing how it's functioning. So it gets to decide what it's going to pay attention to and what it's not. And so the more integrated that brain is, right, we're going to break up those old patterns because when it hears itself, it may not like the sounds it's hearing. It may not like the interruptions it's hearing. It may like them, may not. We don't know. We're not the experts, but that mm -hmm. is the expert. And so when it hears that, it knows, well, I need to pay attention to that or why am I doing this, right? So it has this innate ability to start self-regulating, to start integrating this information of how it's functioning to be able to self-organize for optimal performance. So I like to tell people it's similar to knowing you're, if you get a cut on your hand, you don't have to tell your immune system to produce, you know, more white blood cells, you know, send inflammation, send heat, put a protective layer over. You don't have to tell your body to do that. It just does it. Thank God. I don't need anything else to add to my to-do list. Exactly, right? So yeah. the same is true for our brain. Just needs to hear that information, that flow of electrical activity. Right, because that's all, the only thing we're doing. We're just giving that information back to it. How do you want to use this? You decide. And then the brain has that ability to self-regulate. So it's really out to me when you said the brain sort of heals through hearing. Did I hear you? Did I hear you right? <laughs> well, essentially, yes, through through hearing how it's functioning instead of seeing how it's functioning. Hmm. Right. The mirror is going to show us we're going to visually see this. But through neurofeedback, we're actually hearing the feedback. So the central nervous system is hearing. Oh, oh, that's what I'm doing. OK. Right. And because then it has the ability to self-regulate because of the precise timing of when those when the the algorithm, when the software delivers those breaks in. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Anytime there is that surge cortical activity, music just pauses very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the central nervous system then is saying, well, did I need, did I need, did I need to serve? Did I need to search there? Did I not need, do I need to listen to that? Do I, what can I, how can I benefit from this? What, what of this do I need? What do I not need? And so again, I to the family level as well of how our children hear, how we hear them. And, and if there's, I mean, I would think that there's also a family correlate to literally what, what we're hearing, how we speak to each other and so forth. I don't want to get us off topic, but I, yeah, it's profound. I think hearing is such an orienting thing for humans. Mm -hmm. um, well, and auditory processing is another whole topic we could dive into as well, just in how we hear differently when we have exposure to trauma and how highly sensitized the middle of the ear becomes and those bones become and how we it's almost like we're just muffled. We're just hearing muffled sounds. We're not hearing that clear picture. Right. When we're dealing with some kind of trauma. So there's a lot of impairments to language, um, understanding what language means, because when we're in that state of trauma, we're shutting that down because we're focused on how we're going to fight, flight, freeze or immobilize. So we're okay. in that really protective mode and the hearing is just going to go, I don't need this anymore. Sure. sure. And likewise, then sometimes those low, low, low voices, deep voices, especially man's voices, they're going to be triggers possibly for someone with trauma. Okay. Well, that's interesting too. Where um, higher, um, more soothing or musical, right? Someone singing yeah. is more soothing to someone who's had trauma. Okay, that's fascinating. So what are some common changes um, you see in those who have experienced trauma who begin using neurooptimal or neurofeedback? Um, the first thing I would say is that as the, as the brain and the body learn how to relax, right? Because that's what we're teaching. We're teaching this focused, uh, relaxed state to the brain. While we're doing this, 
we become less and less reactive so that we're not repeating those patterns that sustain trauma. So we're kind of breaking up those patterns that sustain the trauma. And in doing that, we are, um, well, I'm, whole nother topic we can talk about later. My brain just starts going all these different routes we can take here. So I'm gonna stay focused in some of the best ways um, we just have better self-regulation. We start to be less sensitive to our environment. We um, we still might get triggered, right? Yeah. But it's going to be, but our response, our reaction to that, we're going to be less reactive. Mm -hmm. um, of course, learning, memory, sleep, all of those things um, mm -hmm. are are huge. But just, um, I think the one of the biggest thing is just a decrease in the triggers, more flexibility and being able to go in different environments, mm -hmm. um, of course, behavioral and then relationships. But a, but a huge, huge thing that I see a lot is um, an ability to be more expressive. Okay. Um, I always like to make sure that someone is working with a therapist Mm -hmm. um, when I know that, or they've expressed to me that they have been, um, in a, in a traumatic, you know, had a traumatic situation, um, because sometimes then they come in, which is one of the reasons why I'm back in school, they come in and they just start telling you now, all of a sudden they've had all these sessions and now all of a sudden they just want to express it and they feel safe with you and comfortable and they just want to share. And then I just go, I have to refer you out because I'm not qualified to handle all this and, and I feel bad. Right. So um, really, I see an increase in their ability to use other modalities. Right. Okay. Whether it's, you know, mindfulness or maybe they're able to go outside for walks now. Maybe they're able to go to the dinner table now. Maybe they're able to open up in counseling. Maybe they're, they're in speech therapy. They're a child. Their speech improves. So there are all kinds of um things that I see um, improve when we are really working with someone with trauma. That I'm working with where the child has improved. And I think it makes sense that that, that with this idea that they become more expressive, they can become more expressive about, of about, uh, about irritants or things mm -hmm. that are upsetting. Um, can you speak to that a little bit of, I guess, because I think when parents see that, they can assume, you know, it's not going well or something has gone wrong. Mm -hmm. And the child might need uh, more tools to be able to express themselves or mm -hmm. therapy or something where they can, they can express some of that. So can you speak to that a little bit? Right, so think of it again as, we are breaking up those patterns of stuckness, yeah. right? However we want to portray that. I talk with my hands. So we're going to break up those patterns of stuckness. So what used to work well for them isn't, isn't working so well now. Now they can actually tell you. They can be more expressive. So sometimes it comes across as maybe backtalk okay. or irritability. Or, um, and so when a parent tells me this, I say, oh, yay. And they just kind of look at me like, you've lost your mind. And I said, no, no, this is a great thing because now they have this voice. They have this voice they didn't have before. Now they're going to learn how to rein that in. They're going to learn how to use that more appropriately. But it's like gaining a new skill all of a sudden. And now you're able to use it and you don't even know what to do. It's like a, a new little gadget or gizmo on your computer or your phone. It's like, oh, wow, what's this? But you don't really know how to appropriately use it, right? And so yeah. sometimes with children, especially, we'll see that. So it can be expression often, it can be that expressive language. Remember, we're we've we've dampened those signals when we've been when we've had this trauma, and sometimes trauma occurs before we have acquired language. Mm -hmm. So you know, trouble during birth. Mm -hmm. We haven't acquired language yet. Prior to age two, mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of language yet. Mm -hmm. So how we're expressing that is going to show up differently and manifest differently. Okay. So it really would be important for parents to begin to do that and then get the resources they need, the help they need, even if that means their own neurofeedback, right? Um, mm -hmm. But also just, you know, how do I respond to my child differently? How can I see a bigger picture here of what's going on? Uh, I think that's mm -hmm. profound. Very helpful. Mm -hmm.
So we've got to wrap up learning how to I'm sorry. It's really how they're now learning how to respond to their environment where they've been responding here and we might want them to be here. Well, Mm -hmm. they may have to go through some things to get there Mm -hmm. where we want them or Mm -hmm. where they where they want to be internally. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I I highly recommend people um, make sure they're they are working with um, uh, a counselor, occupational therapist, you know, whatever their team is. I, I, I believe it's a team approach mm-hmm. and we all need to be looking at these um, factors that can change mm-hmm. um, during the course of, of neurofeedback. And as additional resource for people, um, we're going to put up your uh, website here, I believe. You've got a newsletter um, that parents uh, or anyone uh, doing neurofeedback can subscribe to and, and just have Christy as a resource. <laughs> You're a resource for me. So thank you for coming on today. And, You're welcome. Uh, yeah. Thanks to everybody who's tuning in or who tunes in later. Feel free to comment at any point and uh, we'll engage in that conversation in the group. So thanks, Christy. Thank you.